Hi there, and welcome to another episode of the Praying Christian Women podcast. Today, I get to be here with Jamie Sumner, who is the author of Eat, Sleep, Save the World, among many other books. Um, she has written for numerous publications, including the New York Times and the Washington Post. She is the reviews editor at Literary Mama, and she's also a mom to a son with cerebral palsy, as well as twins, and she writes and speaks about disability in literature. She loves stories that celebrate the grit and beauty in all kids. She and her family live in Nashville, Tennessee, and we are so excited to have you here, Jamie. Thanks for being on the show with us. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to talk. Yeah, me too. Well, the question that we always start with when we do interviews is, what is your favorite prayer closet? Where do you like to go to be close to God? And it can be kind of crazy or more traditional, whatever, whatever you think. <laughs> I've got a couple and neither of them are in the house. <laughs> um, I would say the biggest place that I kind of tend to find myself coming into prayer, even not even intentionally, is I will get up um, in the dark before anybody else is awake in the house and I will go run outside. Um, and that tends to be that just little half hour of quiet tends to be when I can let my mind and my heart kind of just talk to God. Um, it's peaceful and it's a really good way to start the day. Um, the other, pl the other place, this was back when we were not, you know, quarantined everywhere, but the other place was in the car, um, driving from, from various activities and things. And that I, those little brief spurts of time were, um, really good moments for me to pray and, think about, evaluate kind of the day and how it's going and, and, and bring any anxieties or any thoughts about that to God. So. Yes. And I, I can totally relate to both of those. I feel like being out in God's creation is just one of the mm -hmm. best, one of the best ways, not to mention your mind is being cleared as you're running and yeah, it, it definitely prayer outside for me is, is one of my favorites. Well, it's like meditation. People talk about getting yourself in the right spot and really feeling like all the way through your body, like what's going on and centering all of that. And I think that's what being outside in nature and praying does because it, it gets every part of you focused on God in a way that, and, and calm and centered in a way that, that nothing else does. Yeah. Well, and we'll talk a little bit more about the changes in the world recently, but I, I imagine for most of us, some of our traditional prayer closets are not as effective, especially having a lot of the family at home. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, if you've got a quiet corner with a chair and you have kids or even just a spouse, it's not always a quiet corner for prayer. You've got to find some creative new ways. So <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, before we get into that, though, I just want you to share with us a little bit about your family and Charlie's story. I would love to. Um, so Charlie is eight now. He just turned eight last weekend. We were um, supposed to go to Chuck E. Cheese. Oh. However, I, I, I can't think of a place more. Like, you already leave Chuck E. Cheese feeling like you might have caught something. <laughs> right? Even right? in a normal situation. Right. So, so we got to celebrate at home. And you know what? It was fine because then we got all the cupcakes that were meant to be for the party. And oh. we sang and we gave party favors to – I have five-year-old twins, Cora and Jonas, as well. So they got to run around with all the party favors, and, and it was fun. And so – yeah, so Charlie's eight and the twins are five. And um, to tell a little bit of Charlie's background, he was born 10 weeks premature um, at 30 weeks. And he was born with his first diagnosis was not cerebral palsy. It was Beck with Wiedemann syndrome, which is actually a rare overgrowth syndrome. And I got the call from the Mayo Clinic confirming that that's what it was. Um, and then I went into labor an hour later. <laughs> so unexpectedly. Um, so we found out the same day. It ended up being a huge blessing because we knew to go 
to the university research hospital instead of the one that we had planned to go to. And so Charlie was born into a room full of experts that knew how to, how to take care of him. Um, so that was just the very first instance of God's providence over Charlie. Um, absolutely. And, um, he spent a long time in the NICU. I, and we brought him home, um, probably three months after he was born and he came home with a tracheotomy to breathe out of his throat and a G tube later, he, we went back in for an emergency G tube to help him eat cause he couldn't breathe or eat. Um, cause part of the Beckwith Wiedemann is an enlarged tongue and that's kind of what was preventing him from that. And so the first, I, it's like, if you can look at your, most people look at their child's life in those stages, it's like infancy, toddler, little kid, adolescent. Charlie's we kind of divide up into like critical care, general care, and now we're kind of into kid, normal kid stuff. So back then it, everything was very critical. Um, he slept with an oxygen and heart rate monitor on his little toe. Um, I had to use a suction machine to suction out the trach to keep it clear. And that was, you know, multiple times an hour. So like we were always on alert those first few years. It's just how we felt. And because he was your, my first, you know, you're already like that as a new parent anyway. And then, you know, of course, everything else onto it. So it was a panicky moment by moment kind of existence until he got the trach out and, and he was prone to seizures when he was little as well. And when those stopped and we got to graduate from, um, I used quotes for people listening, air quotes to graduate <laughs> from, <laughs> from neuro, from his neurologist, that was a big day too. So, um, all that to say now he got his diagnosis of cerebral palsy when he was one and he uses a wheelchair to get around and he uses a, a communication device, a speaking device to speak. Um, cause he's mostly nonverbal and it looks like an iPad. Um, he can say a few words, one of which is mama, which is just, again, God's oh, providence, like yes. one of probably five words, five or six words. And one of them is mama. I get him to say it all that I bribe him. I'm like, do you want this book or this book? Okay. Say mama. And then I'll give it to you, you know, and it's terrible, but it's one of those little, like, it does my heart good and it does his heart good. So, um, and yeah, he's a really happy kid now. And we're more in just the general parenting phase. Um, he goes to public school, he rides the bus, they, they pick him up the little lift in the back with, in his wheelchair. Um, we love his, his sped teacher, but he spends all day in the, in the regular general educational classroom, except for maybe 30 minutes. So we, we feel very blessed that this is where we are now because we didn't know. We didn't know in those first few years. It was very uncertain what that, what his life was going to look like. And nobody knows the future, but I just am so grateful that we're where we are. Absolutely. And so is he able to fully communicate using his communication device? Is he, does that just open doors where he's just able to totally communicate? absolutely unobstructed with that or so it's it's so the way the device works it's kind of like learning language in real life in that it takes years to develop that just like you take years to develop the regular communication you use when right. you speak yeah. so so what he does i love it he's so creative so he uses the communication device and he uses some signs and he uses the few words he has and then he can say yeah, uh uh, and yes, uh huh, to anything. So, our shorthand, verbally, with, yes, verbally, verbally, he can yes. say those things. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, our shorthand is I'll hold up two hands for him and I'll say, You want this or this? Or do you want to do math or reading? Or, you know, and give him mm -hmm. choices for everything. And he touches the hand because what he understands is on level or above average than all the other kids his age. So, he mm -hmm. understands everything. So, what's really sweet is the kids in his class will, um, have learned this and so they'll come up to Charlie and they'll be like do you want me to push you on the swing in the playground or do you want to go for a walk and like he'll touch and so they have learned how to participate with him which is just amazing so he does all of those things to communicate and if anything I'm like wow so he's better than we are because he's learned all these different ways to express himself because yeah. he had to but it works wonderfully for him <laughs> 
That is amazing. And just to hear you say that his, the kids in his class do those things just warms my heart. Is he in a good class where you're happy with the kids or does he face any difficulties in his classroom with bullying or kids being unkind? So we love his class so much, so much. Like I couldn't even say more. I, I, I think also when you're in, he's in first grade and I haven't really met a first grader I didn't like. So they're right. kind of at that age where they're all sweet and they want to help and they, yeah. they want to like love on each other, which of course I just said, I don't know the future. I am already praying over, you know, when he gets to middle school and high school, what that's going to look like. Um, my biggest fear I think with Charlie is not that he'll get bullied per se, because he's literally the nicest, most cheerful person you will ever meet. Yeah. Um, I would be more fearful that he would be ignored, I mm -hmm. think, because he is nonverbal and you have to work to get to that place. And I think little kids are really good at wanting to do that, but maybe middle schoolers and high schoolers aren't. So I'm already praying over that, you know, because God has that. And, and I have to kind of let that go whenever that, that fear creeps up. I loved reading that. I read that was at the end of your book and mm -hmm. It just really, um, I just thought that was so profound. And so what I found in this book, I went into reading it thinking, this is going to be a great book for me. I don't have a child with special needs. Um, and I thought this will give me insight into how to pray for families with special needs. I have several very close dear friends that have children with special mm -hmm. needs. This will help me, you know, be able to relate in that way. And I came away with so many amazing take, home, take homes for myself. And I just came away feeling like, okay, moms of kids with special needs experience motherhood amplified. Like that's, that's what I felt. I felt like, and maybe you even say something like that in your book. Um, but I just saw that, okay, these things that you're struggling with along the way as you share these deep parts of your story and Charlie's story, they're the, the advice that you give and the encouragement that you offer is encouragement that's applicable to every mom because we all deal with certain things. Maybe we've never had a child in the NICU, but we know what it's like to have a, a sick, vulnerable child in some area and mm -hmm. you know, or have a crisis in, in the life of our child. And but all of these things, including what you shared at the end, is just on a, on a smaller, different level, is something everyone struggles with. Our fear of, you know, on one hand, there, there are those of us that might fear that our, our kids would be too seen and, and stand out too much and be bullied. And on the other hand, feel like they're invisible or that kids aren't going to take the time to see the things in them that we see in them that are just that make them special, the things that God like gave them. So I just, I loved this book for myself as well as for anyone else. And of course it gave me just a, a really broader perspective of how to be able to support and pray for families with kids with special needs. But anyway, I just wanted to tell you, I loved your book. <laughs> Well, that is, that is so encouraging for me to hear because that was my, that was my prayer too, as I was writing it is it. And I, and I say this all the time to my friends that don't have kids with special needs because inevitably something will be going on in their life and they're stressed and I want to hear about it. And they preface it with, so I know that this doesn't compare to what you've gone through. And I always say it does. That's the thing, because the hard thing for me and the hard thing for you, we still feel it, that same level of hardness, no matter what the thing is. We still feel the same level of fear or, or joy or exhaustion, no matter what the actual thing is we're going through. And so it isn't a comparison. And I feel like if I could speak that to people who don't have kids with special needs, that would be my biggest thing to say is your hard stuff is just as hard as my hard stuff. And so I want to hear your hard stuff too, you know, because if we can't lean into each other like that, then we're, we're isolating ourselves and it's, and it's not, God doesn't want us to do that. He wants us to live in community. And so all those kind of 
this versus this, you know, those graphs of like my life versus your life. I, I just really feel like we're all in this together, parenting our kids and wanting the same things for them. And so why shouldn't we lean into each other no matter what the situation is, you know? Yeah. Well, that's, yeah, that's something that I've wondered also in, in talking to my own friends that have kids with special needs. I do sometimes censor my complaints because I am thinking, well, that's silly for me to complain about. I know what my friend dealt with, you know, just the other day or is dealing with constantly. So yeah, no, to hear that is encouraging. Um, well, I want to just talk specifically before we get into the book and some of the, the things that came out of it. Um, what, how are you doing right now? And what is your day-to-day -day life? How is your day-to-day -day life different? I have been through this whole COVID-19 crisis and the, the shutdowns and schools being closed in many places. My heart has just gone out to families with kids with special needs because I can imagine that therapy appointments are being canceled. Um, educational services that they depend on are not happening and horse therapy, swimming therapy. I mean, how, how, like, how are you doing this and what's going on? <laughs> Tell us how you're doing. Whew, that is a good question. And you know what? Thank you for asking because it's something I'm still processing. Um, yeah. At the time that we're recording this, uh, my kids have been out of school since March 5th. Okay. So about three weeks already. Yeah. And then we just found out today that they're going to be out at least through April 25th. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that it, I think it was harder initially because everything was unknown and every day was do we're waiting for this call to see what, what's going to happen with school or what's going to happen. The twins are, are supposed to be doing baseball and softball, you know, what's going to happen with that. And, and, and there's all these things that, that every day we were waiting for news. And so everything felt kind of the ground felt uneven, I guess, on each day. Mm -hmm. But now we've kind of settled into, okay, this is our life for at least the next month. So, and, and I, and I will say, okay, this definitely applies to, to the idea of parenting your, your child with special needs, because there's some, there's some switch that gets flipped when you accept the situation you're in and then say, okay, we're going to roll with this because this is what God has laid in front of us. And it doesn't have to be, I don't have to sit here and continually wish for a different scenario because this is the scenario we're in and God's going to use this somehow. It's like the, you know, somehow I'm going to look at this with curiosity and not regret. Hmm. And, and I think, so to put this down with the COVID stuff, just in the past few days, probably, I've kind of felt that switch. Um, you know, I was sad Charlie's missing his horseback riding therapy. He goes to once a week. I'm sad he doesn't get to work with his speech teacher at school. Um, and it and everything just felt, I was just missing everything. Yeah. But then recently, something in, in my heart, I think, and this is absolutely God, has made me start to be curious and creative in ways that I wouldn't be if this weren't happening. So creating new ways for Charlie to do math with my old school flashcards from when I was a kid, um, <laughs> for real. And, and blocks that the, tw the twins had those colored blocks. I did permanent marker on each of them, numbering them one to 10. So he can also work on fine motor, picking them up to show me the answer and stuff. And, and getting him in his stander, which he doesn't take to school, like he's loving being able to stand a lot. And so things that, oh, we bought a trampoline for the twins. Oh, yes, we yeah. did. <laughs> Put it together in the rain. So all of these things that would not have happened if this all had not happened is happening now. And so I'm trying to embrace it. Again, I am not like if angels are not singing to me right now, like it's not all glorious over here. I'm, I'm hiding in the bedroom because everyone else is elsewhere and there is no personal space anymore, anywhere, right. anywhere. Um, <laughs> and then talk to, if we had recorded this podcast, probably at like five or six, which is dinner time, then bedtime, 
I might not sound this chipper, but overall, I'm feeling like I have a little bit more perspective of kind of where we are um, with all of this. That's good. And I love that perspective. And you, you do bring that up in the book. There are a couple of different ways you put it, but just the curiosity and kind of approaching life with the eyes of a child and mm-hmm. discovery. Um, and I think it kind of goes into that, the idea of embracing hardship rather, tr- rather than triumphing over the hardship. Yes. What, how would you explain that in like, kind of, as you talked about it in the book? Cause I love that concept. I think there's a sense when you talk about triumphing over hardship that it puts it all on your shoulders, you know, because to triumph over something, you personally have to conquer it. And that is a lot of responsibility to take on that God does not want us to take on. Um, He never wanted us to be self-sufficient. We were created in his image as his children and therefore we need to trust like that and lean into that. Um, and I think when we say triumphing over something, one, that's too much pressure. And two, let's say we do, then the glory goes straight back to us, right? Because we are the ones that made this happen, if that's how we feel about it. And I think embracing hardship is more about approaching it with a sense of learning Like what is coming out of this situation that I need to be focused on and aware of in ways that I wouldn't if I were just powering through it. Um, And I don't mean embracing hardship in a, in like, I love that my child is in the middle, in the middle of a transition in learning and I don't know how to kind of, approach his educational team about what to do next. That's not a fun feeling. And I would never sugarcoat any of those things. You can't say I love it that my insurance is turning down our, you know, request for more therapy. Like none of those things are things you're you're gonna love. But I think that if you can make yourself be a little more still in those moments and let yourself feel whatever you need to feel with no judgment because God is not judging you about all these feelings, um, then I think you can approach it with a little bit more um, self-care as well as care for your child. Yeah. And, and I think it takes the, I don't know how, the fragility out of the triumph because a, a triumph, when it's all on you, the moment you lose that sense of control, the moment you crack, the moment you lose that confidence, then it's done. Then you're just, you've fallen. But when you're embracing where you're in, it's okay to fall apart sometimes. Mm -hmm. It's okay to be like, wow, this really stinks. And and that's okay. I'm going to, this is what, this is what it is. God is still in it. And let's look for where he's working and then keep moving forward. Whereas I feel like when you have that idea of triumph, it's scary because it is built on kind of a house of cards sometimes, or maybe the temptation would be to pretend everything is okay, even at times mm-hmm. when, when it's not. So I just appreciated that perspective. It's Along- scary and exhausting. Right, right. It, it, that'll wear you down faster than anything. Yeah. Well, and, and you kind of touched on some of the things that, that seemed, in the, in the book you talk about, this period of time when everything kind of started to fall apart with Charlie's school, not being able to afford the school mm-hmm. that he had been in. And then all of a sudden, like God provided all of these different things. Um, I imagine that when you are a parent of a child with special needs, there are so many more obstacles, which in turn provide, I don't, I wish I could remember exactly how you said it in the book, but basically <laughs> that, that those times provide so many more opportunities for God to show up big. So could you share kind of the story of that time and what your prayer life was looking like or what your, I mean, I don't know, I guess I'm going to ask a whole bunch of questions. Number one, <laughs> Was all of that a result of concentrated, God, we need this, we're going to sit down and pray for this? Or was it just, I don't even know what I'm going to do, God knew your needs and provided them? That's question one. 
it was very much more the second yeah. uh, part of that because I yeah, it was because this was Charlie was about to turn three and that's when, you know, you typically you age out of early intervention services, which are provided free by the government. And so he had, he had been doing all, he'd been getting therapy and followed by developmental specialists and all these people. And we knew when he turned three that a, a lot of that was going to go away and we were going to have to figure out what to do. And the only way we had been able to pay for his private preschool was because all, we didn't have to pay for all these other things. So we were going to have to make some really big decisions about, do we pull him from this school where he's getting feeding therapy during lunch with his peers and learning how to interact with them and working on speech with them? Do we pull him from that? Um, but also, how are we going to be financially responsible during all of this? And he was getting aquatic therapy at the time, which was apps. I mean, the first time he ever walked was in the water with little weights on his legs. Like, how do you say, no, you can't walk. Right. I mean, so it was a very stressful time. And I think because it was so stressful, you know, everybody, when you get stressed out, you you can't think clearly because you enter that panic mode and all you can it's like all your feelings are louder than your thoughts um you know we tried to make pro con lists and and we did and and they did help because they made some of what our emotions were screaming from all different directions clearer i guess on the page of what we needed to do but it was very much i didn't even know what to pray because i didn't even really know what i was asking for and so I kind of just, I was still going for runs. I was going for a lot of walks with Charlie back then. And so that's when I prayed a lot when I was walking with him in his stroller. And I would just go for these walks and just let myself, you know, I've said this before, feel whatever I was feeling. Mm -hmm. And then that kind of became a prayer. It wasn't even words. It was just feeling those things. And then as God started to follow through in ways I'd could not have guessed, could not have, you know, we talk about triumphing over hardship. I couldn't have triumphed over that on my own because I didn't even know to ask for these things or yeah. to fight for these things, all these things. So that was a really big moment where I just felt blessed beyond measure and it was nothing I was doing. And it's like, okay, the equivalent of, <laughs> so eventually all of us are going to be able to go back to school. The kids will be able to go back to school. The parents will be able to go back to work and the world will return to some semblance of what it was before. And just for a moment, imagine, let yourself go there to that feeling when you first put your kids on the bus again, or you first get to get in your car and drive to your job and do the normal thing of getting your coffee or whatever it is, we are going to be so grateful and it was nothing that we did in our own power, but God has shifted the world and here we are. And it's just, you just feel blessed beyond measure for the regular things. And I think that's kind of what that feeling was. It was just, it was just being washed with joy because things happened and we were able to keep him in his preschool and grants came through for therapies and, and things that were just miraculous. Like that's why they're called miracles. They're beyond us, you know? I loved that story. And, and I love the fact, cause I, I gathered this from just the way that you wrote the story that it wasn't like you, you and your husband sat down and prayed every day, God provide certain things. And I think it's so important to remember that when we're in times either where you're, you know, exceptionally stressed or have a lot on your plate or just too tired to know how to pray. I mean, that's still prayer. Just being with God, you know, the spirit intercedes with groans too deep for words. He searches our hearts. He takes it to God. And I love that example that you gave of, you know, just encouragement to women. If you don't feel like you have words to pray, Go for a walk and let yourself feel whatever it is that you're feeling in the presence of God. Like that is prayer and that is powerful and we can't negate that or, or ignore that because sometimes I think we're afraid that if we don't have the words or if we're not sitting down with our hands folded and our Bibles open, that it's not prayer. But what you did, I love that example. So I think that's going to 
I don't know. That's encouraging to me to remember. So <laughs> thank you. I think God will take whatever little bit we can give, yeah. you know, and yeah. do everything with it. Whatever tiny little bit of ourselves we can just give, even yeah. if it's not words. <laughs> Well, and you talked on talked about making lists, and this is another thing, just a practical thing that I loved when when you mentioned in your book that because I'm a list maker, when I have decisions to make, yep. you know, if it's not abundantly clear, and unfortunately, my husband and I joke, we're like, why doesn't God ever just make our decisions really easy, like you know, it, but they never seem to be, and so we'll make lists, we'll pray through the lists, we'll look back and forth. And you said you were making lists because, you know, with Charlie, you've had so many decisions to make along the way. And you said, the moment I feel myself trying to sway the list to one side or the other, I know yes. what I need to do. Oh my goodness. That was so helpful. <laughs> it's just, it's like the list, what you actually put on the list almost doesn't matter. It's, it's the act of doing it. And then when you start to try to manipulate the stats, that you know, you know exactly where your heart is inching. And then you can look at that and say, am I inching the right way or not? You know, like, am I, you know what I mean? Like, am I inching this way because this is my want? Right. Or is this also what God wants for me? And so it kind of reveals where your heart is, which it's, and it's lovely because it is one of those bl black and white things you can do that shows something in you that feels murky. Mm -hmm. You know, it's almost like it brings it to the surface and then you can look at that too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, can you share some of the, like, how does, how, how has this decision making process that's ongoing, particularly for Charlie, um, how does that look in your life? How, how does your prayer life work in making those decisions? How, how has God showed up or how has it been hard to navigate at, in different situations when you've had to make these very big decisions along the way? One of the biggest decisions um, that we had to make early on was whether to get that tracheotomy mm -hmm. in the NICU for Charlie. That was our first major parenting decision because it was our decision. And that is terrifying. It's, do I voluntarily send my child off to have major surgery and then potentially be immunocompromised for years and years, maybe forever, if he can't learn to breathe on his own? Um, and what if it doesn't work? Because part of the thing the doctors were saying at that time is this could be neurological and not just his tongue. So he was forgetting to breathe apnea type stuff because of the way his brain was working. And that isn't going to be fixed with a tracheotomy. So we had all of these unknowns and then we had to go into it. We had to sit down and make this decision, <laughs> which, you know, and you're in the NICU all the time and exhausted from no sleep and worry. And you're not thinking clearly anyway. Um, and at that time, my prayers were often tears. I just cried and cried because everything felt too hard to handle. Um, and I think in those times, um, the way that God helped the most was he put people in our lives that could speak truth to us when we couldn't make the decision. So Charlie's ENT and the head of the NICU and our pastor and uh, a f my friend who became my best friend, who was Charlie's primary nurse in the NICU. I didn't know her before she became his nurse, but we're best friends and we go to all each other's birthdays and we celebrate holidays together. And I threw her baby shower for her first baby. So all of these people God put in our lives to help us make the decision because you can't always make it on your own. And I think God sends people to speak truth to us when we can't hear it. And so we trusted the people in our lives to help us make this decision because I think society now is so individualist mm -hmm. and it's so like survivalist. Like you do your thing and 
you, you conquer the world and you, you have to be self-sufficient. And I think that's a lie. I think we're not meant to be self-sufficient. And when those big decisions happened, God showed us ways to lean into people that could help us make the choice and, and show us that we were living in a community of people we could trust with Charlie. Um, we weren't just, it wasn't just us and Charlie. It was us, Charlie, and all these other people. And yeah, and that, that's such a gift. And I think we have to be looking for that. Cause like you said, it's, we've mm -hmm. become so individualized and so independent and, and this idea that we have to do for ourselves. And so I do think, you know, God didn't design us to be, to operate outside of community. And I mean, I think that's why our churches are so important and our extended communities too. So that, yeah, that's, that's a huge way that God can come through. So do you, um, do, have you come to a place through this journey where, were there ever times where you were angry with God or even felt like he wasn't there that, that you just hit a brick wall spiritually? And if so, how did you get through that? There were, um, lots of times like that's, that's one thing about this book, um, Eat, Sleep, Save the World is not like, it's not, you know, I didn't want it to be an instruction manual for how to do things right um, because nobody, nobody needs another list. Nobody needs another like task list in their lives. Um, they don't need, especially special needs parents, like they don't need an instruction manual for their kid. I just wanted to be really honest about where I was in all these places because what you what I wanted for the book is for people to feel connected and feel like they weren't isolated and that we're all kind of comrades in this together. Um, and so with all of that, I ha was angry often. I mean, because things felt unfair, yeah. not for me, but for Charlie. That's yeah. what really, you know, I remember, worse. you know, that's a worse, it's worse. yes, <laughs> it's so much worse when you, when it's your child, you would so much rather take that onto yourself. And mm -hmm. I remember, you know, Charlie had major tongue surgery at seven months old. Um, and I remember it was huge, big, scary surgery. And I, you know, I remember seeing him afterwards and his head was swollen and he had this, the foam thing around his neck that was covered in iodine from cleansing him, but also blood. And it was just, he had stitches coming out of his mouth and, and, and he was intubated at the time because it was, he was so little and he had the trach. And, and I remember there had been a mix up with the pain medicine. It did not come through. The orders didn't come through when they were supposed to. And he was in, you could see it on the monitors. You could see him by how he was acting in the little bed. He was in serious pain and nobody would do anything about it. And I have never felt anger like that, I think, in my life. Like um, a righteous anger. <laughs> a righteous anger. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, there, I also said a few bad words, which were not so righteous, like, <laughs> in my head. But, like, it's, it's, that, it's that feeling of you are there. I have no control over the situation, and it's not a fair situation. It's yeah. not fair. Um, and I had that also when Charlie had a, his real, the worst seizure he ever had and the twins were born and they were not even a year old and I, they wouldn't let me ride in the back of the ambulance with him cause it was so bad and they wouldn't let me touch him when we got to the hospital and he was reaching for me and they wouldn't let me touch it. So all of these like crazy heartbreaking things and you, you start to think this is so unfair it's so unfair. And the, the best advice I would give to anybody feeling that way in situations like that is to say to God, this is so unfair mm -hmm. because then at least you're still talking to God, yeah. you know, like I think the fear we get all the time is that our emotions are too big or we're going to turn God away if we <laughs> come at him with whatever. Um, and for me, the biggest thing that I tried to do through it all was just keep talking to him, even if I wasn't saying nice things to him, because yeah. at least I was still acknowledging that he was there. Mm -hmm. um, and then later, of course, when we came through all of these, those things, I could look back and see how God was providential and still there. You know, that tongue surgery, yeah, 
he it did let him get that trach out and he does not have a trach today and i am so grateful for that you know and he did get the pain medicine spoiler he got it eventually and and you know the seizures i told you we graduated from from the seizures and so everything all of that was temporary and i think we have to remember that about our emotions too in those situations the anger and the bitterness is temporary too um, and if we can remember that, it doesn't feel as heavy. And you don't have to be feel guilty for feeling that. Like, God's got it. I mean, he, of course he does, you know. He is outside of time, and he has already seen all of this happen all the way to the end for all of us. And he feels it just as much as we do when hard thing, we go through hard things. And so I think remembering that makes it a little tiny bit less weighty, or at least removes the guilt from feeling the way you're feeling. Oh, and I think that's so important just to write, you know, before you get into that emotional time, make, make a rule <laughs> that even as, as bad as your emotions are, as angry you might, as you might be, that, that you are still expressing that to God and just kind of mentally mm -hmm. removing the guilt from being able to express that anger or disappointment or frustration to God, because like you said, he can take it. I mean, I think of Jesus on the cross, you know, he's like, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know, he expressed that, that ultimate feeling, you know? And so, yeah, I think that's, that's very freeing for all of us when we get to those times where it just feels like things aren't fair mm -hmm. to say it to God. And then when you get back to the other side of it, you can look back and maybe you know, continue to see maybe how he was working in those times. And some of that too is we may not see the turnaround positive side effect of it all until heaven. Right. You know, I think we have to remember that too. It's we, we won't always get to see that now, but we will, we will. And that's really important to hold on to. We will get to see that even if you can't find it now. Yeah. And that's our hope is that this mm -hmm. world as fallen as it is and with sickness and disease and suffering and hardship that, that this isn't all there is. And so we have that final hope. Um, you talk about Thanksgiving and the importance of that. And I mean, that's such a huge I don't know. It's just such a huge part of life in general. It's a huge component of prayer. Can you talk about Thanksgiving and what role that has played in your perspective overall in your life and in, in just the journey with Charlie's struggles? I think, and I've kind of touched on this because it, it now runs a thread through my life that I almost can't untangle from everything else, but I think there's something to be said for being grateful for what was, like what has come up until this point in your life that has made you the parent you are that can most uniquely take care of your child mm -hmm. um, and the believer that you are and the lessons you've learned along the way. I think there's something to be said for stopping and taking stock of all of that and really seeing how it all stacks up to make you the person you are. Um, but then I also think there's, there's something crucial about being thankful for the moment you're in, no matter what it is. And I talked about that, talking about the COVID stuff. Like, I think that that attitude shift is enough to keep you afloat when you might not feel like you would be otherwise, because you are thankful because you remember all the other hard stuff you've gone through and that, that God carried you through. So whatever you're sitting on right now, you can be thankful because you have evidence. If you wrote it on a list, <laughs> you have evidence from God that he will carry you through this too. And then I think too, that we can be thankful in advance for the future. I think we can be thankful, like I mentioned, for heaven because it's coming. And whenever I need the most kind of heart uplift, whenever I am sad that Charlie is in a wheelchair while his friends run around him, I remember that one day he's not going to be. <laughs> and that to me 
makes me so thankful um, in ways that I almost can't even express in words because that picture of him like running to me, you know, just and saying, hi, mom, and saying all the things he, he would want to say, I think is really important to hold on to that vision wherever you are, um, that it's going to be different. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, I, is there anything else that you would like listeners to know about this book? I'm going to hold this up for those. We do, we post video. We also do audio only. If you're watching the video, this is Jamie. Oh, look, uh, look, we can double it. Look, oh. look at that mirror image. Yeah. Eat, sleep, save the world. This is one of the coolest book covers I have seen. <laughs> Thank you. I kind of love it too. Fruit Loops. And no, this is, this is one of, this is just one of the most encouraging parenting books that I have read because it's not just a list of, of to do's. It is stories and it has scripture in every chapter to kind of mirror the story that's going along to parallel the story that you were going through. So I would just recommend this book to anybody, whether you have children with special needs or not, this is an amazing parenting book and just an encouragement. So is there anything else that we didn't cover that you would like people to know about this book? Uh, I would say, I kind of mentioned this, but I'll say it again. So this book is meant to be comfort. It is meant to be the thing you need when you're feeling maybe lost or alone um, or not understood in your parenting game that you're playing. Um, the book is just meant to be something for your heart that makes you feel seen. Um, you know, I, the reason I get so vulnerable with my story in there is so that if there's anybody else out there who has felt that they, they know that they're not in it alone. Um, and that's the biggest message I wanted to come across is just that you can be hopeful because you're not alone. Um, and I hope the book reminds people of that, that your story and my story and everybody else's is intertwined in such a wonderful way that, that God is doing a good work in you and me together. I love that. Well, where can we find you online and your book? Uh, yeah. So I have a website. It's jamie-sumner.com and all the information about the book is on there. I will say... Um, with all of the kind of delays in shipping for books because of what's going on in the world, um, the eBooks are on super sale right now for four ninety nine, which Lifeway is doing an amazing thing with that. So it, whatever your platform is that you use to read eBooks, it's four ninety nine right now for everybody. Right, so I we'll, I love that. We'll link to that too in our yeah. descriptions and our yeah description. that that's great yeah. Well, great. Well, Jamie, how can we be praying for you? I'm going to close with a prayer for you. It could be personal or professional or whatever you want for us to pray on, on, it, on the air. <laughs> oh, thank you. Oh, I, well, okay. So the big one I would say is endurance. Um, just pray for endurance um, personally as a mom and a wife. Um, everybody, you know, everybody's home and the days are long. Um, so I definitely need prayer for that. And I would also say as a professional writer, um, it's hard to kind of write when the space you write in is filled um, with things. And so that has been a really hard transition that I haven't figured out yet is how to do my job and be a parent at the same time. Um, and there's lots of people, you know, the book came out right when all this happened. And like many people, a lot of the events that I've have had scheduled have been canceled. And so I would say pray for me and for all the other writers out there that are like kind of putting their hearts on pages and then wanting to get it out in the world that can't, mm -hmm. I would say just pray for them for peace for them and, and success in other ways that, that can make them feel validated. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you for being with us, Jamie. It's been really fun to get to talk to you, get to meet you. I felt like after reading this book, I felt like I already knew you. So it's oh, good. Like, That's the know, goal. <laughs> meeting you in person was just kind of an after, <laughs> afterthought. But thanks for being here. 
Well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. All right, let's pray. God, we just thank you so much for this time. Lord, we even give thanks for this, this crazy COVID-19 crisis that we're going through because you are in it, God. And like Jamie said, we just, we embrace this time and the lessons that we can gain from it and just pray that you would just shed light on those lessons, shed light on ways that we can embrace the here and now and be thankful for the ways that you're working in them. We just, we pray for creativity and wisdom in how to navigate the day-to-day. Um, I just lift Jamie up to you now, Lord, and, and I thank you for just her willingness to pour her heart out into this book for moms of children with special needs, that, that you would just take this word and get it out into the world, get it out to the women that need to hear it, that need to be encouraged, that need to know that they're not alone, that need to feel seen, and just minister to them through Jamie's words and through the scriptures that she's included in here. I just, I pray that salvation would happen through this book, that there would be women that aren't even believers that would pick this up, not knowing what to expect, and would come away with a saving faith in Jesus. And I pray for each one that reads this, that, that she would come away feeling closer to you and free from the burden of looking like she has it all together or free from the burden of guilt or freed from the burden of, of feeling like she's alone. God, I lift up um, Jamie's family and we just pray for this time of just the whole family being in the house together, that you would give her endurance I just pray that you would just infuse her with supernatural energy and joy. Lord, I pray that every day that she would walk through, that even during times that are difficult, that you would just just allow that joy to well up in her that, that's inexplainable and, and help her to see the situations around her um, with new eyes and that she would be able to feel thankful and, and see those blessings at every step of the way. We pray for just creativity for her to know, um, continue to find ways to, to educate and, and continue education for Charlie and for the twins. And um, I just pray for family unity and bonding during this time as well. And we do ask for relief from this time, God, that there would be a time sooner than later when the kids would be able to get back into routines and school and therapies and that you would um, make that time all the more um, sweet because of this time of, of confinement and isolation that we've had to endure. Um, Lord, I lift up her career and just her writing. I just, I pray that, that you would reveal to her exactly what she should be doing now. If, if this is a time when writing isn't going to happen as much, that you would be storing up creative energy so that when the time comes for her to have writing time, that it would pour out of her and that there would be no time wasted, God, that, that this would be a time of inner um, working, that, that the experiences that she has during this time would be used whenever it is that you see fit to, to encourage others through her writing. I do pray for time that she would have chunks of time alone in quiet or that she would find ways to write in the chaos <laughs> and to write effectively. Um, but that she would, you would just direct her and guide her exactly to what she should be doing at every moment and, and when it's okay not to be doing those things. And just for all of those that are writing, that are trying to get their words out into the world, that you would open doors that we couldn't even imagine were even there to be opened to get their words out and to get your message out, especially those that are that are sharing um, sharing messages that, that come from scripture or come from you, Lord. And um, we just thank you for this time together. Be glorified in this podcast episode, in Jamie's ministry. And God, I just pray for Charlie. I pray that he would be seen. I just pray that as he goes through life, that you would open the eyes of so many people to who he is and um, just the amazing person that you have created him to be, um, that he would be seen by others in the same way that Jamie sees him, um, in the same way that you see him, that people would take the time to get to know him. And I just pray that you would be glorified in, in how that prayer is answered as Jamie sees that unfolding throughout his life. And I pray that for all of these children with special needs, 
um, that they would be seen, that that people around them would know them and, and would see their gifts and would appreciate them and see them through your eyes. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.